This is a production of Cornell University. Hello, everybody. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Good. <clears throat> um, welcome. I am Aisha Hutchinson, the current director of the graduate writing program at Cornell. Oh, no, no, no don't, don't applaud. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Thank you. I'll, I'll, take a, I'll take it. Um, I'm just waiting. It seems like a couple of people just got in, so uh, let them grab their seat. This event is happening on the traditional homelands of the Gayakano, the Cayuga Nation. The Gayakano are members of the Ahadusani Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Gayakano, dispossession, and honor the ongoing connection of Gayakano people, past and present, to these lands and waters. Following my brief housekeeping remarks, the inimitable Ross Gay, whose poetry for me lives at the radiant center of what W. E. Du Bois calls the realm of chance, will be introduced by R. Peter Chakabarki a second year graduate fiction student. But first, on the behalf of my colleagues in the creative writing program, I wish to extend my immense gratitude to our donors, Barbara and David Zalaznik, whose generosity and support make this reading series possible. Heartfelt thanks to my colleagues, Helena Vermontes, J. Robert Lennon, Emily Fridlin, Ernesta Quinones, Nafisa thompson Spares, Valjina Mort, Joni Makowski, and Lyra Van Cleef Stefanon. Special thanks to Amanda Lynn Brockner, our MFA graduate coordinator, and Emily Parsons, the office manager for the Literature and English Department. Please take a moment to ensure that your devices are silent or turned off. There will be three more readings in the series following this one, and you can find more information on our website Plus, there are bookmarks and flyers uh, right there next to Ross's books for sale. Now, please join me in giving a hand to Arpita, who will introduce Ross Gay. Arpita. Hey, everyone. How's, uh, how are you all? Good. Okay, um, yeah, my name is Orpita. I'm a second year fiction uh, writer in creative writing program. I would have loved to call myself a poet, but being in the company of such great poets, including the poets in my program, um, I would want to resist the temptation. Um, gosh, I feel a little nervous being here on this stage as a grad student. I have been told that this is for the first time in 10 years since a grad student is visiting, a grad student is introducing the visiting writers. Um, yeah, but I, I yes. <laughs> Being an international student, let alone from South Asia, yeah. But I, since I do take delight in exaggeration, harmless exaggeration, especially if I could flatter myself, and since we would be talking about joys, I would like to imagine that this is happening for the first time in the history of Cornell's creative writing program. Right? Thank you, Aishan. When I received the email on a December afternoon that I would be introducing Ross K, I was sitting in a dark room of a museum in the midst of an artist talk on India-Pakistan partition, perhaps the largest mass migration ever recorded in world history. Before my eyes was this image of a man holding his head 
within his hands. His gaze towards the ground, the camera does not record. While his family is packing mattresses, water jugs, and is tying ropes over all their belongings so that they do not fall off the cart while they travel on foot, I quote from Rose Gay's book, Beholding, in the way, in certain places, certain countries, or countries inside countries, you must leave by foot with nowhere to go." End quote. Another image floated, groups of women hugging, waiting for the train that took them away from each other, separated them from the land they had known as home, cut the umbilical cord between body and spirit, which I sometimes call belongingness. When I looked at the images, my mind resurrected memories of stories I read and was told by my father about Bengal in the aftermath of partition. But I was also thinking about the turbulent history and the present in South Asia, including Kashmir, Sri Lanka, and Afghanistan. The sharing of, ma of pain was settling in my body. It was a moment of being in solidarity. Then I saw the email about Ross K. In a different part of me, I felt another kind of joy slowly leaping from inside, like a rabbit frightened at first from a distance, flushed in the remembrance of the fondness of reading his book, The Book of Delights, and remembering the feeling that this poet, this writer, and this essayist has seen me articulated my love, ecstasy, sorrow in little things of my everyday life back in India, but also here at Cornell, here a non-immigrant life, here as the IRS calls me, non-resident alien for tax purposes, but also about the abundance called life and beauty that I behold in my body and spirit. I have often troubled my poets, often my friends, sitting in the audience here with recordings and text messages, sharing my love and pain of finding different shades of blue, winning a mere game of spades, talking in my mother tongue, Bangla at Cornell, or simply listening to the sound of rain coming and going, going and coming, that carry me across miles and time zones to Calcutta. Yet, I know my body can't, but I'm digressing. Thank you for writing the book. So in that museum, in the dark room, on that December afternoon, my eyes and body held the sorrows, but also the joys, not to negate the intensity of either of them, but what Roske calls joining the sorrows, joining two, is a kind of annihilation. It is a joy. The intolerable makes it worthwhile to borrow from Zadie Smith. Both the joy and the sorrow are the same. Not two faces of a coin, but the same face, Rosgay tells us, if we are looking deeply. Rosgay is the author of four books of poetry, against which, Bringing the Shovel Down, Beholding, winner of the Penn American Literary Jean Stein Award, and Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude, winner of the 2015 National Book Critiques Circle Award, and 2016 Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award. His first collection of essays, The Book of Delights, was released in 2019 and was a New York Times bestseller. His new collection of essays, Inciting Joy, was released by Algonquin in October 2022. Thanks to Buffalo Street Books, the books are available to buy here at the auditorium, and Ross Gay will sign books upstairs at Golden Smith Hall, 258 after the reading. All of you in the, in the audience are invited to the reception upstairs. 
In his new book, Inciting Joy, Ross Gate asks us to lay down our guards, the hard faces we wear every day, and invite sorrow in to borrow from him, because solidarity might incite joy. To share what we love, because sharing what we love is dangerous, is vulnerable. He encourages us to loiter with our time and labor and kindness, love along with our dying. If a friend leaves, ask them to keep the door open on their way out. Create beautiful art that is unfixable and unfixing because we are forever in the process. We remain unfinished forever. It is with a lot of joy and gratitude that I invite Raske to the stage. Arpita, thank you so much. God damn. That was about the nicest fucking introduction. Holy shit. God damn. Thank you so much. God, you changed my reading. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do things a little bit differently. Um, thank you. You know, it's funny to, to like, um, be read in the first place. It's just a profoundly lucky thing. Hi, George. <laughs> it's a profoundly lucky thing, but to be regarded what you did, like we're reading the words closely and, and, and also to like, you know, put our hearts together in a way. That's the thing. I'm gonna read a little bit from this poem, Beholding, um, um, because you mentioned it. And Beholding is a, it's a poem where it's a long meditation on um, a move from the 1980 NBA Finals by Julius Irving, um, also known as Dr. J. Um, against the Lakers, they lost. They would win three years later, don't worry. Um, but it's an impossible move. It's, in, it's incredible, it's impossible. But it happened. Um, beholding, and there's an epigraph, to be held, to behold. That's from Christina Sharp in The Wake. You might have noticed there's nowhere to go. The wind cutting little, no, I gotta start again. I gotta change this if they ever print it again. Because <laughs> I, I took the, per the period off the end of it, but I want it to start lower cased and with the word end. And you might have noticed there's nowhere to go. The wind cutting little eddies at your collarbones and behind your ear. As Dr. J drives from the foul line extended to the baseline, defended valiantly by Mark Landsberger, who in this poem, despite the doofy urge to make him so, is not allegorical, but is rather simply a hardworking journeyman ball player with decent athleticism and size and a floppy mop of dusty blonde hair got caught up in the gust. Sliding his size 16s quick so that Doc, after catching the ball at the elbow and taking one hard dribble toward the baseline, where the dunk would usually commence, could not access the paint, or the lane, or the key, which is what we call the area nearest the goal, which in this case is an iron hole drawn in space and therefore implies a window, though the key makes it also a door that Landsberger, it seemed, was trying to keep shut. And so Doc leapt, he left his feet, which means more or less jumping with the ball with nowhere to go in which we're warned against by coaches from day one for the ensuing requisite stupid pass, or more simply, though no less stupid, travel, also called walking, which the leaping often leads to. Keep your feet again and again, which makes the leaping, leaving your feet, sound sacrificial. The way in certain places, certain countries, or countries, countries inside of countries, you must leave by foot with nowhere to go, which there is. And Doc, you should note, after the one dribble, clasps the ball with only his right hand, without once at all in any shape or form using the left, which, among other things, friends, 
differenti differentiates this move from all the descendant moves. Kevin Durant, Dwayne Wade, Steph, Giannis, Harden, Kawhi. Yes, Bron Bron too. I shall not be moved. And using only one hand, which is amazing, but not yet miraculous, more a physical and therefore genetic fact. Thanks, Ma and Pa Irving. Doc's hand becomes an octopus, gripping the ball, nothing like prey. And with that ball snugged in his mitt, Doc maybe kind of sort of thought something like, I'm going to put this schmuck, the schmuck in this case being Landsberger, though do not please revert to a simplistic allegorization of the journeyman, which word I repeat advisedly, on a poster. Though schmuck is a word I'd be surprised to hear Doc say. And the word posterize, common usage, posterize his ass, you might be thinking is a bit of an anachronism in this poem, in this move, which ostensibly occurred in the 1980 NBA Finals, though we all know that nothing happens only when it happens. We all know nothing happens only when it happens. Emerging more in the epic, which in the NBA lasts three to five years, following Doc's retirement, Neek and Jordan, Hakeem the Dream, and Clyde the Glide, Barkley the Glove, and yo, remember Sean Kemp? Mm -hmm. Though Doc probably thought it anyway, visionary that he was, when will they verb what I keep doing to these schmucks, especially Bill fucking Walton? Driving from the foul line extended toward the baseline is the unsuspecting Landsberger, who did a fine job of shuffling his size 16s and not holding, keeping Irving from the key, and who must, for a scant and fleeting moment, have felt a degree of pride when Doc, after that hard dribble right, left his feet with nowhere to go. Billy Cunningham on the sideline, his hands on his hips, his sport coat thrown open, a few strands of hair stuck to his moist pink brow, and almost smiling as Doc began sailing out of bounds over the baseline, and Landsberger, a solid leaper, skied and foreclosed the possibility of Doc sneaking a shot in this side of the basket, by which I mean dunking probably quite hard, by putting his hand against the backboard, a big door swinging shut, at which fine and commendable defensive effort, Irving simply decided in the air to knock on other doors by soaring more. Have you ever decided anything in the air? I'm going to stop there. And this is going to be like a basketball day. Welcome, welcome. Come on in. Um, this might be a basketball day. This is um, from the essay book, this most recent essay book. It's called Insurgent Hoop. Um, you know, so I, so I kind of contemplate. After I wrote the book, I started to get better at, better at articulating like what it's actually about. Um, and I kind of offer a definition of joy. I was saying this to the students earlier today. But I think... I think one of the things I'm sort of trying to figure out in this book are like, where are sites of practiced um, entanglement? Sites where we practice entanglement in various ways. And so I talk about the garden, I talk about the orchard, I talk about school, potentially. I talk about um, cover songs, which we have more time, I'd read it. It's a good one, I love it, I love it. I talk about Luther Vandross a lot. I know. I know, I know. This one is called Insurgent Hoop. Pick up basketball, the ninth incitement. Now, I've skipped over a lot of the basketball books, a lot of the sports books, partly because they so often rehearse the same old dork ball, bootstrap, capitalist, Darwinist fantasies. They suck, I'm saying. They are brutal, I mean. So I'm actually nothing like an authority. Let me never be. Let's get that out of the way. But as far as books about sport, I've never read anything even close to John Edgar Wideman's Hoop Roots. I have a lot of footnotes in this book. Footnote, OK, OK, about sports that aren't basketball. Eduardo Galeano's Soccer in Sun and Shadow. It's remarkable. I've never read anything even close to John Edgar Wideman's Hoop Roots, published 100 years after Du Bois's The Souls of Black Folk. 
which Weidman did on purpose to give us an idea of how crucial he considers basketball to be to the soul of the nation. We must contend with hoop, he's telling us. It's classic Weidman, storytelling, history, theory, analysis. Better than any writer I know, he articulates the fiction of race and the material conditions that fiction has wrought. Better than any writer I know, okay, Toni Morrison, okay. <laughs> he studies the murderous lie of race the way you might study someone's game. Dude always goes left, but he's shifting in traffic, so heads up. Also, he doesn't miss open shots, so get a hand up. But stay on your goddamn feet, because he's good with his fakes. Best I've ever seen. Pump fakes so crisp, you don't even know you're going for it till you sail by and he stepped in for an easy 15th footer and boom, you're dead. Weidman was a very good ball player at Penn. And he stayed a bona fide baller decades beyond that. But you can tell he loves the game in a special way, a la DeBarge, by what he sees, which is not probably what you or I see, which I guess is testament both to love and vision and by the words he chooses to say it with. By which I mean to say, though I love this game, I no sooner would have likened someone dribbling back and forth behind the back a few times to them toweling off their ass. But especially if they're not real low, which they probably should be, it really looks like that. A million of them he has, looking with the eyes of someone who could do it and the longing that he'll do it no more. The way things become more lustrous, dearer, when we know they are, when, they, when we know they or we are disappearing. This might be, incidentally, the beginning of an ethics. Though I doubt that was the first thing I was thinking of when I read Hoop Roots the first time, probably right when it came out in 2001. I wasn't yet 30, both of my parents were still alive, and my knees, despite being tore up, were still pretty supple. But now, at 48, that Weidemann is writing from his new status as a former ball player, is a ball player ever former? As a spectator, as a witness, whatever the word is to imply that what he did he will do no more, that's to say the elegiac yearning with which he writes, a yearning that sutures the elegiac to the erotic, it is desire after all, it is only for one night, as Luther Vandross sings. Well, let's just say I kind of get it. These days, hoop, more than anything, makes me realize, as my buddy Dave says it, that we have a certain number of jump shots. It is written on a cosmic tablet. I don't know that Dave would co-sign the cosmic tablet part. And one day we will reach that number. Boom, no more jump shots. Or if you were a bit of a flyer, as I was, boom, no more dunks. But probably no boom. Probably it will be a whisper. Probably it will be a Bergman film. I'm lying on a couch as my brother snores in a bed across the room, and his oldest daughter, there are pictures of me holding her, one of the cutest babies ever born, her little sister's the other. She's in a day bed curled up, now almost six feet tall, kind and curious and with a penchant, much like my brother, for being delighted. She is a reminder, as kids I guess are, that so-called time, goddamn, Where'd that go? I knew you when you couldn't talk except for babbles and laughter and crying, and you wore those cool little red overalls. I knew you when dunking was easy and frequent and not a negotiation with the gods. I knew you when my jump shot was wonky and occasional and required some negotiating with the gods. Boom. The reason I'm sleeping on a couch in the same room as my brother and niece is because we're taking a bike ride a very leisurely trip down a rail trail along the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon, which, no kidding, while nothing at all like the other Grand Canyon, I mean nothing at all, is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. And I've been outside of Philadelphia, I've been outside of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia too. <laughs> it's beside a gentle creek that has, I guess, over the millennia, cut this groove through the Appalachian Mountains, which are lush and languid and thick with trees, from which we saw bald eagles, yes, plural, emerge and take flight three or four times. One landed almost directly across the creek from us on a dead tree, and we were all suddenly whispering. 
They're sleeping, the child silently, the adult snoringly, as I'm writing these sentences. By the way, a conversation between my brother and me after this very leisurely ride. Me, Maddie, why are you walking like that? Is your knee hurting you again? Maddie, no, I'm old. <laughs> but before we got on the trail, 10 hours ago, we were at an outdoor outfitter's place. They take your keys and drop your car to the end of the trail for you. And directly behind their place was a pond you could hear before you could see it because of the frogs croaking. It was green and scummy with algae, pierced with cattails, elderberry on the verge of blooming. And as I walked by, I could hear but not see the frogs plopping from the muddy shore into the muck. I needed to pee, so walked to the other side of the pond to a trail into the woods. And as I was relieving myself, I saw a sign maybe 10 feet away that read, private property, no trespassing for any reason, exclamation point. Violators will be dealt with swiftly and to the fullest extent. <laughs> An unrelieving sign if ever there was one. I am shabby at many things but I am a good reader. I bring my whole self to the task. And as a not white person in beautiful bumblefuck PA, I discern in this baggy haiku, in addition to some interesting line breaks, violators will be, packs a Hobbesian punch, makes you, wanna, makes you wanna huddle up and arm up and lock your doors, Jesus. The absence, the poetic or literary term might be elision, of the phrase, of the law, a phrase that I am fundamentally skeptical of, for the record, though in this region of abundant we support our police signs and Blue Lives Matter flags, I'm pretty sure the elision is a not friendly and emphatic reminder that you can be killed because my property is more important than your life. Back when I first read Hoop Roots, gosh, right around the time that kid sleeping across the room was born, Maybe I was reading it when she was asleep on my mother's, her munga's lap, a lap I also slept on, though it's been a while. The passage that lodged in me more than any other is toward the end of the book about the beanpole baller who used to play decked out head to toe in stolen goods. Not basketball gear, dress gear. Gear for a night on the town. Beautiful shirt, slacks, dress shoes, a belt, the whole kit and caboodle. He would get the duds from a crew of boosters who stole from the finest stores around. In Pittsburgh, where Weidman's from, that would probably be Kaufman's. My thieving friends, when and where we grew up, preferred Macy's. These were stores that, if blacks were allowed in, it was reluctantly. Probably the very presence of blacks in those stores felt to the owners like a kind of trespass. I wonder why. Oh, I know why. Because those black people some of them anyway, are the descendants of property whose refusal of the idea, i.e. liberation or disowning, in the good old days could be dealt with swiftly and to the fullest extent, and whose very existence disrupts the idea, I mean makes plain the lie of property itself, whose unpropertied life is insurgence. I suspect this passage, which comes late in the book, appealed to me because it helped me to understand my powerful, if inarticulate, feeling of fuck them and their stuff. A kind of rage that was easier to stomach than the sorrow beneath it when my broke folks would pine for what people with dough didn't matter, didn't matter their color, didn't matter they might be my relations, had or could do. I thought, fuck them and their stuff. Lots of fantasizing about torching expensive cars and chucking bricks through fancy stores where security might trail me if my likes went in. Some petty theft and breaking things at my college for rich kids. A very precise fantasy about wanting to vomit, not figurative, I mean to get myself to puke, in the midst of the outdoor diners at one of the fancy restaurants in Rittenhouse Square. I wanted to get it on their shoes. It was some kind of refusal percolating in me, I think, that reading in hoop roots about this kid bawling in snazzy stolen gear and ruining it, I loved, 
And I loved it because it was a sophisticated, embodied, performative, and social refusal of a way of life. Matter of fact, as Weidman says, the ballin' and hot clothes says, quote, here's what we really think of your stuff. And further, it says, the only thing I want to do with your destructive way of life and what it's done to us is destroy it. Fuck you and your stuff. And maybe even fuck you and fuck stuff. And where better to do the show than on a pickup basketball court, where the game itself is also a refusal of their way of life, where the game itself also tears stuff to shreds? How do I mean? No one owns a basketball court, and no one ever could. Even if on that court someone might be owning someone else, by which I mean playing better than the person they are matched up against, or owning enough someone else's to feel like, delude themselves into thinking, they own the court, that simple thought will be yanked like a tooth from their head soon enough. Maybe by someone they thought they were owning, and they will be back on the sidelines, a wanderer again, asking permission to play, possibly of another someone whom they previously imagined they owned. On a pickup basketball court, no matter how good you are, you will ask to be led on a team and into the game, which is to say you are a perpetual guest. Likewise, on a pickup court, when you have the next game, you are often inviting others onto your team. And so you also, has, and so you also get to be a host. On a pickup basketball court, you might have the opportunity to call the next game, I got next, but you can't call the next three or the next to eternity, which is, just, which is to say, pickup doesn't abide the settler. Try that shit on a real court, tell me how it goes. Nor does a pickup court abide the grudge or the fixed opponent or the enemy, given that whoever pissed you off earlier in the day crossed you hard enough you fell on your hands and knees and everyone hollered and laughed or shouted every time you caught the ball beyond 15 feet, let him shoot, will probably end up, if not in a couple games, then in a couple days on your team, passing you the ball. And in that way too, the pickup court laughs in the face of purity. A five, as we call the team we've gathered for this game, as long as we stay on, score more points than the other team, is momentary ephemeral, miscegenal as hell. On a pickup basketball court, unlike the terrifying sign I encountered on land inhabited and stewarded and belonged to for millennia by the Haudenosaunee before the European settlers arrived and got to genocide in, which, including, which included cutting down every last tree, I mean every last tree, before they moved on. Aside from a few things, how much a basket counts, what's out of bounds, there's no fixed law. There is only us, 10 of us at a time, depending on the court, assembling and disassembling and reassembling in perpetual negotiation of the rules, in perpetual common wonder of how we're going to be together today. What's going to be a foul? What's going to be a carry? What's going to be a walk? What's going to be our mode of protest, our mode of acquiescing, our mode of negotiation, changing with every game? I've heard it called a swarm. I like to think of murmuration. A school's not bad either. And I like to think it suggests we belong to each other or are practicing at it anyway, without which there's no game. Which is to say, belonging to each other is what we're playing at. And belonging to each other means belonging to the game. Belonging to each other is the game. It reminds us this game, the true version, to almost quote Paul D. talking to Setha and Toni Morrison's beloved, we are each other's best thing. And at Seeger Park on 10th and Lombard, footnote, this court was, one, was in one of the neighborhoods Saidia Hartman writes about in her book, Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments. Just as this essay and book would be impossible without Hartman's, so too would the practice of that court have been impossible without the innovations of the young women Hartman writes about in her book. And at Seeger Park on 10th and Lombard, my home court between 1998 and about 2006, games started on weekends at around 7.30, where some of the earliest would start gathering. We were creatures coming to water. I could hear it before I could see it because I lived right down the block. 
And often by the time I crawled out of bed, threw on my gear, chugged some water, and got out there, Gerald's little sister would be there, maybe with a girlfriend, with a smile sleepy enough that when she croaked, what up, beast, it made me giggle. They'd probably been up all night. Little sis had that dozy crossover into her mid-range jumper. And then here comes her big brother, Gerald, G, who called everyone cousin, especially in moments of debate or tension, reminding us we're kin here, always dragging a few sleepy teenagers from the apartment so they don't miss the run. And here comes Pop, his slip-ons itching the sidewalk, always with a jug of water, and sometimes his pipsqueak daughter, who sometimes became our daughter, if Pop was on the court and she stumbled out there after her daddy. There was a dude, the spitting image of Raekwon, Sixers adamant. Little Nate, built like Spike Lee, a grasshopper, always wore sweats, hustled his ass off, came on his bike, and was the single person at that court to call me by my government name. That put-together together kid with long braids and only one hand who went to the hole like Marshawn Lynch, the two Js, the first who played at the community college, silky shot, and whose full speed pull-up defined to stop on a dime, J2, a tough guard who defended and knocked you around and liked to yell and laugh and pass to himself off the backboard 20 years before LeBron was doing it, and who acted to me like an uncle, like a big brother, when I told him I was in school up at Temple, saying, all right, beast, all right. Debo, muscle and a loud mouth with whom I felt often on the cusp of a scrap. Crafty Pee Wee, think Rod Strickland with the prettiest smile in town. Marl, a tough kid I loved and loved to play against. And banging against him crotch to ass in the post, I realized ball is sometimes plain air frottage. Marshall and his oldest, unless it was all the kids. That stiff white dude who could shoot. That white dude who rode his mountain bike over and talked loud like he was good. That light-skinned woman, was she a lawyer? Maybe a teacher. Seemed to be looking out for us. She could ball. As soon as there's 10, first five from the line, that's teams. Let's go. All birds sing, but maybe early birds the loudest. Or it seems that way anyway. Especially when the early birds are mostly black across from the fancy condos, down the street from Whole Foods soon to be Amazon, playing a game whose song is loud and brash and consoling and flaunting and flouncy and tender and cackling and profoundly unsingular, endlessly emergent, schools in the kingdom, practicing for an elsewhere we're in the midst of by practicing it, practicing the elsewhere we imagine. Pick up as an elsewhere, I'm saying, whose logics, by which I really mean practices, grown up with and by black people, though not exclusively, don't misunderstand me. Refuse ownership and the owners. Refuse settling and the settler. Refuse the very conditions by which we became black or white or whatever in the first place. Because those conditions are the end of our time here on earth. Which raucous bird song mustn't disturb the dreams of those who think they can own the world, for even their dreams must be guarded against trespass, maybe their dreams especially, and as such must be dealt with swiftly and to the fullest extent, which means on a court, in a school of elsewhere, in the kingdom of joy, they had to take the rims down, which means, once again, we would have to find each other elsewhere. Meet you there. Thank you. Let's pause here and do Q&A, and then if there's a, maybe I'll read one like New Delight. I have this next book of delights that I'm finishing up right now, so maybe I'll read a delight. Any questions? It's okay if you don't have any. Yes.
how you allow yourself permission to do that. I don't know. I think I must have guides. I must have teachers at that, you know. I have dear friends who, over a lot of years, we've been sort of thinking hard about this. Like I'm thinking of the writer Patrick Rosal, who's like my best friend, and who I feel like for 20 years, 25 years, we've been trying to like think about that very question. As writers, like how do you be, how do you be, you know? Um, something that sort of came up almost not quite in the talk with the grad students, um, but actually in your introduction, you sort of alluded to it. How do we, um, in a certain kind of public way that being a writer is, be again and again unfamiliar to ourselves, which is, that's a kind of tenderness, because it's like, you know. It's yeah, it's a little vulnerable, yeah. But yeah, I think it's usually for me, it's like there's models, I have models and teachers. Friends, yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a nice story to tell is that I, I was, uh, I think the first time I was here, I think I played football co in college. I went to Lafayette College, and I think we played Cornell. I think we came up here. I think that was the first time I was in this town. Um, and uh, that's, uh, that has nothing to do with anything. <laughs> it, just came out of my, it just came out of my mouth. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Next. <laughs> Um, but I was like not doing good at school. I got to school because I played football and you know, I wasn't doing well. And, um, and I had a professor in a, in a survey of American lit, it might've been like a 20th century poetry class or something, required me to give a presentation on the poet Amiri Baraka. And um, it was a risk. It was a risk for him to do that. Um, and it changed my life. Like, I was not interested in school. I was not interested in, you know, reading or anything like that. Um, and then I do think it was a little bit like that. I was like, oh, I'm just studying Baraka hard. And then I'm starting to read, like, other poets, like a wide range, Sylvia Plath and Mark Strand and, you know, Sanchez, Tony, Tony Sanchez. And so that's a thing. His name's David Johnson. Um, and... Uh, but you know, I feel like I was learning long before, like, because I was deep in music as a kid. When I was playing sports, I had a sense of the performative that was involved in that. So I had a sense of like audience, or you know, and all these other senses that those things give you, senses of timing. Um, sometimes a sense of irony, or a sense of sort of like uh, ways of looking at things from other perspectives, you know? Um, so that's the first part. Like, there's a kind of one locus of the beginning that's fun to say, sophomore year of college. Um, and then, you know, all the other ones. I can talk about my mom and dad. You know, my mother is very hyperbolic. She sort of, like, loves to, you know, I feel like that learned kind of metaphor from my mom. And my dad, too. Like, I can go on and on. In terms of our practice, um, at this point, it's my job, you know. And so it's kind of like when I go to work, I'm like, you know, I'm just going to work. Except unlike a lot of people, I, I like my job. <laughs> you know? And partly I like my job because at this point I realize that what I'm trying to do is just like ask deep and abiding questions. I'm just trying to wonder about stuff on pages, you know? And that's a lucky thing, and it's kind of what I want to do regardless. Like if we were having a conversation, that's what I'd be doing. I'd be like, tell me about yourself, and, you, blah, 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 and we'd get to know each other. And I'm kind of interested in doing that with myself, too, on the page. So, so you know, that's a way of saying that I think it's, you know, once I figured out why it's interesting, why it's, which is also fun and moving and, and difficult, all those things, then it's not even like a, 
it's not even like going to do something. It's just sort of like, I'm going to think on something. You know, I'm going to... Does that answer your question somewhat? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Well, I would say we're beholden regardless. <clears throat> but I suspect like some of these kind of practices like actually are useful for, for when that's not as easy. But also like today with the grad students, we were talking about like being entangled, like sort of practicing our entanglements. And I do feel like in a deep way that that's like one of the things that's beautiful to be in relationship with people is because when it is not accessible to you, it is nice to have someone be like, here, I made you bread, and I would like you to notice that, you know, or whatever it is, you know. Um, that's, which is again, always and always to say again and again and again that it's like we do it with each other, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's so important. It's not, it's not, and, and I think maybe that's one of the things too. Like, I feel like that idea even of like, well, how do I, whatever the question is, how do I keep my spirit? Like, I'm deprived. I'm like, I'm empty of it. Like I am, you know, destitute of my resources to feel good or whatever it is. How do I do it? I, 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 I. Maybe it's like, okay, let's, how do we make it we or something, you know? Or how do I acknowledge that it's we? Yeah. Oh, you know, this inciting joy has a lot. Um, I think I hear people talk about the delights, the Book of Delights having a lot of garden stuff, too. I think it has quite a bit. All of them have a lot about the gardens, though. What do you want to know? <laughs> oh, God, am I? Oh, yeah, crazy. Yeah. Oh, let me tell you a thing. Let me tell you a thing. So I wrote in an essay, and I sort of was thinking about this. <laughs> this, is so, this is so dumb. I was sort of thinking, I, in the beginning of the gardening essay in this book, um, I was talking about um, the catalogs coming in. I'm sitting in front of the wood stove talking about the catalogs coming in. And I was looking at the Fedco catalogs. I don't know if you know the Fedco. They, they're beautiful. They're handmade, they're, you know, hand-drawn, and they have all these crazy drawings. It's just beautiful. And I said something like... <laughs> If this writing thing doesn't work out, maybe I could get a job drawing for the Fedco people. <laughs> so someone from Fedco sent me a couple, they didn't send me an application, but they did send me a couple uh, catalogs. I was like, hey, I'm the editor at the Fedco place. So I got like, you know, just making moves, making moves. <laughs> the garlic's coming up. You know, I think we're gonna do, you know, we're about to put in the order for potatoes and gonna try to be, you know, early, put peas in early. I'm sort of like, I'm not an early person, so, so some of that early stuff is hard for me, but, you know, I've been, you know, I always do good on greens, and dandelion greens have become kind of, you know, like the cultivars, always the ones that just grow, but the cultivars, I'm growing them a lot. Yeah, I could talk a lot about a garden. Yeah. Yes? Do you mean that in like a good way or in like a, <laughs> or do you mean that in a you poor thing? <laughs> What'd you say? A good way, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Not until now. <laughs> no, that's great. I, no, I never have. I really never have, you know. Um, it's so interesting. That's such a great question. You know, because even as I was reading this essay, and I'm sort of, I'm writing about someone who's actually like, he was probably about 65 when he got to this point where he was like, okay, I'm hanging it up. And he was hanging it up because he was like a good basketball player and probably was like, I can't, I can't play beneath a certain level. Um, but, 
when I was reading that, I was sort of thinking about it in a different way, a little bit of like, oh, like, it even kind of went through my head as I was reading it. Oh, I wonder how long, you know, I'll be playing basketball. Um, but, yeah, I guess they, you asked a simple question, and the question is, and the answer is, I hadn't until now. Um, <laughs> but I love that, I love that um, it is interesting that it wasn't, all, there's all kinds of ways we could probably speculate about why, but it is interesting that it's not until I'm about to turn 50, you know, 48 years old, that I could write about basketball endlessly right now. But I wasn't doing it when I was 30, when I was in the midst of playing like the best basketball of my life, probably, and the most basketball. You know, I mentioned in that essay that there is something of the, uh, like the erotic and the elegiac are tied up together. Like what craving, desire, and kind of mourning are really tied up together. And I, want, I wonder now that you, now that you asked that question, if there is a, this is a way to sort of um, not die. <laughs> yeah. The best love they do evolve. They, that's exactly right. Yeah. 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 That, I mean, that's a great point. It's just a great way to think about it that I hadn't thought of it exactly. Thank you. Yeah. I've been really deep on. Amazing Grace, Aretha Franklin's uh, record. Um, yeah, um, been writing about that a little bit. Yeah, like I wonder if now I'm writing about music because I it's my way to sort of be, try to be a musician or something, you know? <laughs> um, I've been listening to a lot of her. I've been listening to, um, I went on this run, this like Michael McDonald Doobie Brothers run recently. Man, they are so good. They are so good. Um, I mean, they were good before Michael McDonald, and they're good after Michael McDonald. He's amazing, Michael McDonald. I've been kind of in a, like a DeBarge thing a little bit. Um, who else was I listening to? Maxwell. I was in on, on a Maxwell thing recently. Um, Steve Reich, a contemporary composer. Steve Reich. I've been listening to him quite a bit lately. Um, I've been getting into the, the books. There's a group called The Books. Um, listening to them. That's a handful of people. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Uh, Hi. So thanks for being here. You're welcome. That's like a real philosophical question. I think either way, it's like yes, right? The answer is yes to both of those. If you were my friend Dave, he would be like, well, yeah, that was when you stopped using it. That was your cosmic number. Um, it's funny because he hangs it up, and then he'll tell me, oh, yeah, I was shooting around the other day. And I'm like, wait, sorry. So it changes. <laughs> but compared to the age of the stars, it really doesn't change. It's all the same. <laughs> it's all the same. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so obviously, you know, we've had a bunch of years now with no, very little persons, you know, it's like so much fear of each other. And I, I mean, even just being in this room right now, I kind of want to be like, we're here. We're together. We're amazing. And I like, want to reach out and help people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I was, again, I was sort of talking about this a little bit earlier today. I agree with you powerfully. Um, and I feel like, um, I feel like there is a, a vested interest in convincing us that we ought to be afraid of each other. Um, I feel like if we believe that, if we're susceptible to that, if we're alien to one another, if we're made abstract to one another, they can do any fucking thing they want to us. Um, so anyway, <laughs> I'm not going to do that again. This is called hugging in the co-op. <laughs> it's kind of, kind of an Ithaca thing. 
I'm sure you have a co-op. <laughs> I am probably what you'd call a game or even enthusiastic hugger. And so the year or so long prohibition on the act, you know, like for those of us who went along with those recommendations, bummer. A bit of angelic anti-establishment punk rock graffiti that arrived in our neighborhood sometime in 2020. Advice I was still too terrified to take, though I was glad to know it was out there. Hug your friends. I recall the first time I hugged someone, not my partner in the interim. I guess not my partner or mother or a friend who was feeling suicide for a little while, go figure, and showed up on our street, on our step, shivering in obvious and dire need of a hug, was in the co-op. And when we hugged, well, I really noticed it. And then a week or two later, during an official, though short-lived reprieve from the previous year or so long moratorium on hugging, before they realized not everyone was following orders and getting their shots, after which revelation, the hugging had to slow down or be only among an in-group. It was kind of like pre-loving versus Virginia that way. Hugging the wrong person would doom the race. I saw another friend who seemed to have spent the previous year terrified, more frightened or maybe differently frightened than me, but she had recently been protected and purified. And so when she asked if I was hugging, I opened my arms and said, yep, and we too embraced. She leaned her face against my chest and we melted into one another, also outside the co-op. If I were to place pins on a map of my first post-moratorium hugs, most of them would be outside the co-op, <laughs> which for me anyway, recommends the place. Anyhow, the hug, yes, I guess that is one delight or as many delights as there are hugs to give or receive if you like hugs, which not everyone does. But since I do, the return of the hug for that brief spell, the reprieve from unhugging was likewise a delight. And the next reprieve from unhugging a delight as well. It is another example of the deprivation of the delight making the delight light harder. I mean brighter. I suspect after the next prohibition on hugs and the lifting of the prohibition, the hugs will again be that much more delightful. Though I've made up my mind. I'm with that punk rock graffiti and I've been terrified out of touching who I love and who too wants to touch me for the last time. As William Carlos Williams says about poetry, which I'd say is also a kind of touch, we die every day for lack of what is found there. Anyway, I was in the co-op picking up a few odds and ends for dinner and a dude with longish hair and flip flops and a relaxed manner came up to me and held out his arms as though to give me a hug. And when I looked puzzled like, I don't know if I know you, he reminded me he was the former principal of a school I've worked with, a great principal who told me at least two things that really stuck. One, children whose teachers believe they're going to graduate will graduate. And two, he eats magic mushrooms every new year. <laughs> That's the principal I want. I went yo or hey or something to express my happiness, which was genuine and deep for dude kind of changed my life. The shrooms thing's less than the believing in kids thing. And then he said, I want to give you a good meaningful hug. <laughs> Something like that. Hi Hippie-ish, men's group-ish, untoxic masculinity Lee. <laughs> and he did. It was so meaningful. <laughs> his head kind of tucked into my chest, his hands on my lower and upper back a gapless torso to torso, several long breaths worth of hug, enough hug in fact that at first I thought, damn, that's a lot of hug. <laughs> Remember, I'm not shy this way. And second, when he wasn't letting go, I thought, well, I guess this is what we're doing. <laughs> in the avocados and onions and potatoes. I think I saw some shallots back there. And I kind of dug in, I relaxed into it several more long breaths of hug, after which we had a brief but very eye contacty conversation. <laughs> Still two thirds, maybe three quarters arm in arm. And I remembered why I loved that dude. <laughs> hey, I think it's probably time to go, but can I read you one more, just one more? <laughs> Okay, okay.
If you got to go, just go. Thank you for coming. This is short. Paper menus and cash. Extra credit if you stay. Just joking. Just joking. <laughs> Favor menus and cash. <laughs> you know, my editor was like, hey, you might be a little bit too much back in my day in this book. <laughs> I don't believe that. Dave and I got together for breakfast today at the Owlery, the vegetarian place in town with owls for a theme. I don't know about you, but when restaurants or people have themes, I'm always like, what's up with the owls? I don't mean disparagingly or dismissively what's up with the owls. I mean with curiosity. Was it a book? Was it a dream? Was it a dead favorite uncle who loved or looked like or was an owl? <laughs> or maybe it's more like style, the trappings of style, something you try out or do until it starts to do you. And if you're James Harden, say, whose nickname is now The Beard, you're sometimes like, damn, I wish I could shave this beard. Or if you're my friend Rachel, who only wears orange Converse, your heart breaks a little bit at the beautiful purple pair on the rack you know you won't be getting. Or if you're the Owl's restaurant and someone brings you a beautiful velvet bald eagle teddy bird, you say, oh, thank you, then tearfully toss it in the trash out back. <laughs> or if you're me and you like to wear rubber bands, yes, wear, it's fashion, inherited from my father, there's a story or two. Enough that you walk the earth half scanning for rubber bands, periodically endowing them with a magical, salvational quality, i.e., this is the rubber band that will keep the airplane in the sky. This is the rubber band, middle of a busy street, that is going to keep the baby safe, which is to say, style can tip into pathology, so heads up for that. The masked server asked us if we could use the QR code or if we would need a paper menu. I hate to tell you, by which I really mean it delights me to tell you <laughs> that though I submit to more nefarious shit every second of every day of my life, I will not submit to that. <laughs> and as much as the telling you is a delight, the not submitting is way more. The refusal is joy. <laughs> Footnote, we sometimes forget that one of joy's primary expressions is refusal. I will not support your war. I will not accept your policy. I will not obey your law. I will not let you cut down this grove of trees. Refusals which are the evidence and practice of belonging to something larger than yourself. Larger to and by far than whom and what we refuse. The refusal is among the offenses of joy. Though Dave was in the streets about the collaboration between the CIA and the Contras, allowing cocaine to flood American cities in order to fund the anti-socialist forces in the early 80s, he also doesn't want to dwell on the miseries. Dave has kids who are the inheritors of this. I get it. It's one of the nice things about hanging out with him. Also, and maybe a little more to the point here, Dave, this is the same Dave with the cosmic jump shot. Cosmic, yeah. Also, and maybe more to the point here, Dave's so old school, he didn't really know what a QR code was. And so he was a little baffled at the exchange, which I explained to him by showing him the little evil square and pointing at his phone <laughs> and saying a bunch of words I guarantee you he stopped listening to before I got them out. In the event that you haven't stopped listening, first, thank you, truly. And second, cash. Remember cash? <laughs> Though there is no lament long or deep enough for the potential evils embedded in the abstraction of the earth and labor, which maybe cash is, it's way cooler than the mandatory chip, i.e. digital modes of payment, which seems to me part of the general monitoring and surveillance regime we somehow almost overnight, it seems, got cool with. Not to mention, quiet as it's kept, not everyone has a bank account or a card. And it seems to me those people ought to be able to get a coffee too. I'm a dinosaur. I know. The thing about paper menus is that they, are often most, that they are most often kind of plastic, heartily laminated, but not this one. This one was printed on an elegant leaf of thick paper and was quite unused, these days being these days. These days being these days, you can forget that part of the pleasure of the paper menu, laminated or not, is running your finger along its offerings, 
stopping at what sounds delicious, tapping it as a way of saying, ooh, I might get this, to who you're with, who might do the same, which you might then do to the server, who might bend just slightly to consider what you're considering, to listen to you and help you. And when you're done ordering with a paper menu, and in this way it's like cash, you get to place it with your actual precious hands, if you have them, back into your server's actual precious hands, which you might also do while making eye contact and smiling and saying thank you, all of which we did. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.